Well, how does pressure work, Dash? Oh. Can you show me how isobars work, please? Okay, I got it. That makes sense. All right, well, this makes a lot more sense. Thank you so much, Dash, I appreciate this review. All right, so I'm ready to make a video now, so let's cut to the intro. Hello everyone, it's Mr. Waz, and welcome to a very new episode of Wazly Science. In this episode, we are going to be talking about weather. So we're just going to go ahead and get started, whether you uh, like it or not. The weather topics that are going to be included in this video are layers of the atmosphere as well as air composition. We're going to be getting into air pressure and how it's involved with elevation, temperature, and water content. And then we're going to get into what isobars are and how warm and cold fronts work. And at the end of the video, we're going to get into humidity and saturation as well as the types of clouds. All right, so there are five layers of the atmosphere. From the surface where we are, it starts off as the trophosphere, and then it goes to the stratosphere, mesosphere, thermosphere, and exosphere. In the trophosphere, that is where all the weather exists. So that's really what we care about the most with this unit. Uh, jet planes go in this, in this layer of the atmosphere. It's only 10 kilometers high. Uh, but once you get into the stratosphere, you have the ozone layer, which is a really important part of our Earth because in the ozone layer, that is what protects us from UV rays. And it also makes the temperature of this layer slightly hotter. So if we go over here to the right and we look at the temperature, we can see as we go up in elevation and altitude that the weather decreases but as soon as you get to the stratosphere the temperature begins to increase and then when you get to the third layer up the mesosphere in this uh, layer the temperature once again starts to decrease this is generally where meteors will break up and then once you get into the thermosphere the temperature starts to go up 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 now what you have to consider here in the thermosphere is there are very few molecules up in that layer. So there's so few molecules that it actually would feel very cold because there's very little amount of molecules around your skin. However, the molecules that are up there are moving extremely fast. So if you took the average speed of the molecules, which is what temperature is, it would appear to be very high. But since there's a lot, there's very little amount of heat because there's not a lot of molecules, which is the total amount of kinetic energy. And then in our last layer, we have the exosphere, which is basically space. So if we can just do a quick review of the layers of the atmosphere here. In the trophosphere, it's a thin layer, only 10 kilometers. That's where the weather is occurring. Temperatures decreasing with increased altitude. The surface is absorbing the heat in the stratosphere. The temperature begins to increase. You have some clouds that are really high up. This is where the ozone layer is, and the ozone is absorbing UV radiation, which is why the temperature is increasing there. In the mesosphere, it begins to get colder. A meteorites break up in this layer. In the thermosphere, that's where you'd find the satellites. Temperatures increase here. Um, in the exosphere, this is the last of our layer, and they're still the particles that are in this layer are still gravitationally bound to the Earth. All right, so let's get on to the composition of the atmosphere. It's pretty simple. Majority of the atmosphere is nitrogen, 78%, and then about 20.9% is oxygen. And then a very small portion of it is argon, which is a noble gas, and then you got your other gases and carbon dioxide. And if you look to the table to the right, you can see what those other gases are. And I have a cool BuzzFeed video on what, what would happen in the world if oxygen just disappeared for five seconds. Pretty much everything you could think goes wrong. So I'll provide a link to that on the description. Okay, let's get on to air pressure now. So air pressure is the measure of the force with which air molecules push on the surface. It's really important to understand that air pressure is the greatest at the surface of the Earth because there is more atmosphere above you to push you down. So air pressure is dependent on three variables. It's dependent on the elevation or the altitude, temperature, and water content. 
This is a really useful graph because it shows how elevation and temperature go together with when you go higher in elevation of our atmosphere. You've probably drew something very similar to this already from the previous slide. So how does air pressure change with elevation? As your altitude increases, the air pressure decreases. That's because there's less air above you to push down on you. All right, so let's break that down. These blue circles that you see here represent molecules that are in the atmosphere. As you can see, there are more molecules at the surface and there are less and less as you go higher in altitude. Air pressure on the surface has an average about 1,013 millibar. Some people just say 1,000 millibar even, or one bar. Now, one bar is equal to 14.7 PSI. A lot of times people just round that to 14.5 PSI just to make it easier. Now what that is, is that's the amount of pounds that are pressing on your body right now per square inch. So if you are at the surface, you have to remember that there is more air that is pressing against you. There is 14.5 PSI, 14.5 pounds of, pre of per square inch that is pressing against you at all times. That is a little unsettling to be honest with you. Now what you have to remember is your body is pressing against the atmosphere at 14.5 PSI as well. So that's why you don't just smash into pieces or you know implode or something like that because you are pressing against the atmosphere at an exact equal amount. Now let's say you go higher in altitude. So you climb a mountain. There is less air up there because there is less molecules pressing against you. So pressure decreases as you increase in altitude. Now this goes along with probably what you already understand about the ocean. So if you are at the surface of the ocean there's still about 14.5 PSI pressing against you. But as depth increases in the ocean, pressure will increase. So as you go deeper down, there's more pressure because there's more ocean on top of you. If you go down 33 feet, the pressure that is on top of you doubles. It, it increases by 14.5. So now you're at like 29 PSI. So every 33 feet, you go in the ocean is another 14.5 pounds per square inch pressing against you. And the ocean is an average of 4,000 meters. So don't go too deep when you are scuba diving. You don't want to die. Okay, so we're done with elevation. Now let's go on to temperature. Air that is warmer will have a lower density due to the increased movement of air molecules. And air that is cooler will have a higher density due to the lack of movement of air molecules. So air that is hotter moves more. It moves more, it's more spread out. Air that is cooler moves less and gets closer together. And that's a really important thing because that's basically why we have weather. Because there's a different amount of temperature that is on the surface of the earth all the time, because the sun's coming up and coming down as we're rotating um, every 24 hours, that creates air that wants to go through convection currents. Hot air is rising, cool air is sinking, and that exchange of hot to cold is always what's making weather because that's what makes wind. All right, so last we have water content. Moist air is less dense than dry air and therefore has a lower air pressure. A water molecule has less mass than other molecules that make up the air. So if you replace some of the air molecules with water, the air becomes uh, has a lower density. And that's what lowers the air pressure. Now, I didn't really believe this at first, so I had to do a little research here. So let's say you take... H2O, which is two hydrogens, one oxygen, you take their molar mass, one plus one plus 16 equals 18. 
Now let's take nitrogen. Now nitrogen is always N2 because the two nitrogens will bond together in the atmosphere. 14 plus 14, that's 28. That's a bigger number than 18. And if you take oxygen, which is the other part of what the atmosphere is made up, O2, 16 plus 16 equals 32. So there you go. That's mathematically proven that water is a less dense than what a majority of the atmosphere is, which is 70% nitrogen, 21% oxygen. All right, so when we look at air pressure as a whole, when the air is more dense, it will have a higher air pressure. And there will be more mo air molecules in a given space to push down on you. And when the air is less dense, it will have a lower air pressure because there's fewer air molecules to push down on you. Generally, air moves from a high pressure system to a low pressure system. And that's what the direction of the wind is going. So we can see in the seesaw diagram over here, air moves from a high pressure to a low pressure because it wants to move from a higher concentrated to a less concentrated. In weather, we mark areas that are high pressure systems with a blue capital H. And we mark areas that have a low pressure system with a red capital L. Air pressure in a weather system greatly affects the amount of water or evaporation precipitation and therefore the weather. When you have a low air pressure, this results in generally bad weather. You'll have stormy, cloudy, overcast kind of situation. When there is a high pressure system, that usually results in good weather, like clear skies, no rain, you know, bright sunny day in the neighborhood kind of thing. What you want to see on this air diagram on the right is when you have a high air pressure system, the air is sinking, and so the air at the surface is becoming more dense. So because the air is dropping, that means that the air in the sky is not so dense, so there's not a lot of clouds. Now when there's a low pressure system, the air at the surface, there's not a whole lot of air, but there's a whole lot of air molecules that are collecting in the sky, which is where the clouds are. So that's why you would see precipitation. All right, so let's look at a couple diagrams here. When you are at the surface during a high pressure system, the air is denser. And because the majority of the air is at the surface rather than up in the sky, you would see clear sky. So it would be sunny out and not a lot of clouds. You might see clouds really high up, but nothing other than that. When you have a low pressure system, a lot of the molecules are up in the sky because the air is rising. So you would see some cloud formation, you see some condensation forming and possibly some precipitation. Let's take a look at it a little bit more detailed here. So in a low pressure system, low pressure systems rotate in the northern hemisphere, they rotate counterclockwise. A high pressure system rotates clockwise. Now you have to remember this is how they rotate at the surface where we are as well as in the sky. In a low pressure system we would see the clouds forming because it's raining and in a high pressure system we would not see. Now why are they rotating? Well they are rotating because I hate to break it to you flat earthers the world is round and we have a couple things like the Coriolis effect that's happening with the rotation of the earth that causes these pressure systems to rotate. We can read the air pressure with a barometer. Barometers come in a variety of different ways. This one that you see to the right here is one that you would see on many teachers desk. The way that the one on the right works is when the liquid that's on the spout on the right is higher than the liquid that's in the globe that would signify lower air pressure and when the air pressure is becoming higher the liquid in the spout would appear to be lower than the liquid in the globe so you kind of have to think about it in the opposite sense um, higher is lower and lower is higher um, but barometers they they use usually like a type of vacuum. Uh, the older ones had mercury in them, and when the air pressure would push down, it would cause the water in the vacuum to then go up. Basic system there. So when 
there are two air pressures, like a high pressure and a low pressure, interacting when they meet, you get what's called a front. The fronts are very important because the fronts are indicating this sort of change of weather, and we care about that. So let's look at the types of fronts that can be. We're going to focus the most on the cold front and the warm front. These are very important, and you can see the symbol that they use for the cold front. It's sort of got some blue triangles to it, it looks like teeth. And the warm front has these little red semicircles on them. So you can think of the teeth more as the unfriendly situation because that's kind of what they produce. Because if we look at a cold front, you have that cold air mass that sort of is bulldozing its way into an area and it pushes up that warm air mass. And because all that warm air is going up there, you're going to get some condensation and you're going to get some clouds and you're going to get rain. So cold fronts bring rain. Warm fronts are a little bit different. Um, you'll have the cold air that's not really moving, and the warm air is moving, and so it moves in sort of an upward fashion, and then you get these clouds, these cirrus clouds, high, high up in the sky, but usually you just get some friendly weather, nothing's really going on. A stationary front is when nothing's really happening, there's a cold air mass and a warm air mass, the air isn't really moving, and you might see some clouds, but not a whole lot going on. In an oculated front, you could have two different sets of sort of cold air, and then you got the warm air above, and then you got a certain direction that the front's moving. So um, that can create some interesting situations as well. You can have a variety of clouds as well as rain. And again, we're only going to really focus on the cold and warm fronts with this unit. All right, now let's look at isobars. Isobars are really important when it comes to weather. They are a line that we have on maps that connect points having the same atmospheric pressure at a given time. And what they reveal to us is the high and low pressure systems. So we can see an example of some isobars down here. We can see a high pressure system and we can see a low pressure system. This slide is one of the most important slides on this video. Um, it really depicts the difference between a high pressure system and a low pressure system. So first off, high pressure systems are usually at their core above 1000 millibars, which again, 1000 millibars is like the average air pressure. Um, pressure decreases from the system. So you can see here it goes 1,025, then 20, then 15, and 10. And a lot of times isobar move, isobars move in increments of 5. That's a pretty common number that we see with isobars. The isobars within a high pressure system are usually far apart from one another. Now you can't really see that in this diagram, but just take it from me. Usually the bars themselves have a lot of space between them. And, the, and having that lot of space between them means that the air is not moving very fast. It's moving slow, which means that the winds are going to be weak because winds are essentially differences of air pressure, differences of air masses moving. Um, next, high pressure systems rotate clockwise. We talked about that before. And a lot of times, high pressure systems come from the higher latitude areas. And we call them polar air masses. So we get a lot of high pressure systems from the most northwest of our country. Um, so you're looking at Washington and Canada. A lot of um, high pressure systems come in from that direction. So low pressure systems. Low pressure systems are usually below 1,000 millibars and the pressure increases from the system. So we can see over here in this example, it's about 980 millibars and then it's going up rather than down as you move away from the pressure system. The isobars in a low pressure system are usually really tight together. Now again, with these two diagrams, you can't really see it, but generally the lines with a low pressure system have them really close together. It means that um, air is moving very quickly, so you get strong winds, 
And also, the low pressure systems move in a counterclockwise fashion. And these often come from the lower latitudes. So we see a lot of tropical air masses come from Texas and Mexico, that area. Okay, so isobars. They can be a lot. They can be a lot. They can be a lot of numbers. You're looking at this and you might just be like, oh my gosh, what is going on here? Look, try to take a step back over here. You see this H over here? That's a high pressure system. Okay, The numbers are decreasing as you move away from that pressure system and you can see that they're not very close together. Same with this high pressure system over here. Now you we can't see it but above over here there's definitely a low pressure system. The numbers are increasing. The isobars are close together. So yeah, it comes off as overwhelming, but when you look at it and take a step back and you don't just look at every single number, you really start to see how weather works. Okay, so there are two really cool websites that you should go to. I will provide the links on the bottom of this video. Um, you got Venture Sky, which you can explore air pressure, temperature, and precipitation, as well as weather.gov. And just check out the radar that's going on at any day you want. So let's check out Venture Sky. So this is really cool because you can see how the air is moving right now. This is We're looking at temperature right now. So we can see right now uh, temperatures around Connecticut are in the 20s. And we can see how air moves above the United States. It's really fascinating. And you can see how air moves in that sort of um, either clockwise or counterclockwise fashion, depending on if it's a high or low pressure system. And we can see as we go higher above in the latitudes, it gets colder. And then if we get closer to the equator, you know, we're seeing temperatures that are in the 70s and 80s. So let's take a look at the air pressure. So this is the air pressure right now. Um, and what we can see over here, oh, I wonder what this is. It's rotating, it appears to be rotating in a clockwise fashion. Let's see what the air pressure does from its center and then outward. So we can see it appears to be around 1,032 millibars, which is above 1,000, above the average, and it seems to be going down as we move away. So this is a high pressure system. And if we look over here, we can see another high pressure system that is forming in the west. Now, if we just look a little bit over here, off of over to the west in the middle of the ocean, Ah, what do we have here? We have a low pressure system, so below 1,000 millibars, and as we move away, the number is going up. Now, I bet you, if I click on precipitation, I should see some sort of rain going on over here. So let's see. Ah, lo and behold, we have some precipitation that is forming around this low pressure system. So we can see a nice cold front that is over here, and this is a cold front because you got the low pressure and then you got the high pressure so this is our cold front let's see if we go over here we can see some now we see that overall there's not really a lot of precipitation happening over the United States because well there's not a lot of low pressure systems there is a low pressure system that's forming over here over Houston which is why they have that and it appears we have maybe some stationary or oculated fronts that are happening over here but this is just a really cool website because you can just go from air pressure and look for those high and low pressures. You can then look at temperature and see how that's doing. And then what I like to do with this is I like to look at the air pressure like this. And then I like to locate the high and low pressures and then see if I can predict where I will find the uh, cold fronts. Because when I can find the cold fronts, I can then predict where there's going to be precipitation happening. And then if you understand that they rotate counterclockwise, you can then look at the direction that the rain should be moving. And at that point, you are a meteorologist. All right, so let's make a simple concept map here. I suggest you get a blank sheet of paper and get ready to make this concept map. So let's have a little review on air pressure. 
So let's talk about the air masses that are involved. You have polar air masses that create high pressure systems that come from the Washington, Canada area. And then you have the low pressure air masses and those come from tropical areas like Mexico, Texas, the Gulf Stream, things like that. Let's now talk about temperature. With temperature in a high pressure system, the, you have cold air that is sinking towards the surface, so that's creating more air at the surface, which is why it's high pressure. Low pressure, there is warm air that's at the surface that is rising to the sky, and so now there's more air than usual in the atmosphere, so then you get the cloud coverage. Now let's get into the kinds of weather you would see with the different air pressures. With high pressure systems, you would see um, the high pressure system, it would be high at the surface, high pressure at the surface, but low in the sky. So that means that there's a little amount of H2O in the sky to really make clouds. So you got clear skies and good weather. In a low pressure system, there is not a lot of air molecules at the surface, but there is a lot of air molecules in the sky. H2O is in the sky, it's condensating and creating clouds, and then at that point you could have rain and storms. Now let's talk about what the barometer should be doing. The barometer would show above 1000 millibars when it's a high pressure system because the pressure is rising, so it would be sunny. And then when it's a low pressure system, it would be below 1000 millibars because the pressure is falling, which would mean rainy situation is happening. All right, so we've talked a lot about air masses. Let's kind of get into humidity here. So humidity is the measure of water that's present in the air. Water is added to the air through a process called evaporation. You know that already. And this can vary de uh, depending on what the air temperature is. Humidity values are usually given as relative humidity. So what does that mean? Relative humidity is the amount of water in the air compared to the amount of water that could possibly be in the air. Now general rule of thumb is that when the air is warmer, more water can be held in the air. And when the air is colder, there can be less water that can be held in the air. So right now, it's February. So generally people break out their humidifiers right now to put more water into the air because the air is very dry, you know, you need chapstick in the winter, whereas in the summer it gets more muggy, so the relative humidity goes up. Now, if the air is holding half the water it could hold, the relative humidity, you say it's 50%. If the air is at maximum capacity for holding the amount of water that air could possibly hold, you say that the relative humidity is 100%. And if the air is holding no water, the relative humidity is at 0%. All right, so what is saturation? So when the air is saturated, it is holding all of the water that it could hold. Warm air expands and can hold more water vapor than cold air. So it takes more water to saturate warm air. And if the air is saturated, its relative humidity is 100%. And if the temperature drops, you're gonna have precipitation occur. And generally, when you go higher in altitude, temperature gets colder. So that's why we have condensation happen in the atmosphere and have clouds. So what factors affect relative humidity? Um, first off, the amount of water. If you increase the amount of water that's in the air, relative humidity will go up. Temperature. Temperature is the big one. Since warm air can hold more than cold air, if you lower the temperature, the relative humidity will go up, even, even when you don't add any more water. So I really like this diagram because we can see at 10 degrees Celsius, this is what 100% relative, uh, relative humidity looks like. But if we go to 20 degrees, this yellow space represents areas where there could be water vapor, but there is not. 
So now we say the relative humidity is 52%. And if we go up to 30 degrees Celsius, now there's so much space for there to be water vapor, but there isn't. So now the relative humidity drops to 28%. Ah, then there's the dew point. So dew point is that temperature at which condensation will occur. And the dew point is the temperature the air must be in order to be saturated. Because as we said before, when the air is saturated, that's when you will see condensation. And cooling the air makes it unable to hold as much water. So the classic, you know, what happens? Why do I have condensation on my glass of water? Enigma. The ice makes the air, the ice that's in the water, makes the air near the glass cooler. And because you drop the temperature right there, this water that used to hang out in the air can no longer hang out in the air because it's now saturated. So it reached its dew point. So now the air, that water that was once water vapor must become a liquid and it condensates on the glass because as we learned previously, Water is very adhesive, so it likes to stick to stuff when it can. So that's why when you get a glass of ice water, you will have condensation form on the outside of the glass. So why does all this condensation dew point jazz matter? It has to do with cloud formation. Clouds form when the water vapor condenses on this thing called condensation nuclei. What is that? Well, it's solid particles that are in the sky, in the atmosphere. There's basically these pockets of dust that exist in the atmosphere, and it's this landing strip for water molecules to settle down on, and they can use their adhesive powers to stick to the dust particle, and then at that point, they can use their cohesive powers to stick to each other and form water droplets in the sky. Um, examples of condensation nuclei are smoke particles, ash, dust, po pollen, and pollutants. And from that, you can get a lot of really cool clouds, some that you might be familiar with. So you get the clouds that exist on the very bottom where that dew point is low. This happens in the morning often. You have fog. Um, clouds that are not made naturally, those are made from airplanes. You got the contrails, um, cumulus clouds, you got cumulonimbus clouds, which are the clouds that have precipitation happen. Um, the high cl clouds, the series clouds, those are the ones that you would see during a high pressure system. And then the nimbus clouds are the ones that you would see during a low pressure system it's good to have an idea of the of the types of clouds that you can see and what pressure systems would be associated with those clouds I think that's what you should definitely walk away with this diagram here alright guys we did it we got through weather so I got four videos for you to enjoy right here we got air masses and weather fronts right here we got isobars down here we got weather's devastating forces and then on the bottom right here we got world's weirdest weather so i hope you enjoy those videos i hope you enjoyed this one please remember to subscribe and take care